Discord. So I'll take, well, I might take questions as we go along. We might do the Q and A at the end, like we did last time, because it's just a pain in the ass. Um, just to stop, you know, it, it's, I miss actual lecturing, actual, actual lecturing. Yeah. Oh. You can see people and actually realize they have a question. I, can, I, I didn't realize that you can now hear you on the thing. <laughs> I was like, why is there two of them? I'm just going to let Craig, Craig join and we're going to start in tres, dos, uno. I was like, Craig, 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 just. Thanks. That was terrifying. So now I get to do my job professionally. Hello and welcome to the TU Dublin Ethical Hacker Society. That's a long word to say. Uh, lecture slash podcast slash Twitch stream kind of a thing. I'm probably going to tweet it out again just to get more people to come. Uh, today we have the legendary uh, Matt Pat, Patman. Patman begins. It's just a theory, just an infosec theory here to talk to us about information security, kind of the kind of the basics of information security. So you take it away, and I'm going to shut up. Cheers, Sean. Um, yeah, so uh, as far I, I'm kind of of the opinion that uh, cybersecurity isn't really a great term because it kind of limits uh, what we kind of think of we should be doing as information security professionals. So I'm going to go through some of the things today that um, whenever my slide transitions, there we go. Uh, so I'm going to go through some of the different things that make cybersecurity and information security what they are and then some of what separates them and dig a little bit deeper on some of the subjects as well because some of them are really important um so in a basic introduction to it uh a lot of this comes from a fantastic book by uh dr jason andres who wrote a book called the foundations of information security and according to him information security is protecting information and information systems from unauthorized use disclosure disruption modification or destruction and for a lot of people, they have kind of prioritized certain elements of security. And a great example of that is uh, Eugene Spafford, who is an information security professional from the 1970s until I still think now, I think he's still going, um, said uh, as part of a larger quote that a system that is powered off cast in a block of concrete and sealed in a lead lined room with armed guards might be secure. But even then, I have my uh, I have my suspicions. And what he's trying to say is, in saying that, in that we're going to prioritize certain things over other things, and that's fine. But sometimes we over prioritize them and make sure that these systems become unavailable. This is a system that, while secure in some respects, you will never have access to it. And without access to that information, the information is no good. So. To go to build on that, uh, we have models for looking at information security, and you know we've models for lots of things in cybersecurity, like the cyber kill chain, which is pretty common if you wanted to say defend your network, or feed, which is a very U.S. intelligence community kind of way of looking at cyber intelligence. So if you wanted to figure out what different threat actors were doing on the internet, you can figure it out their way. But in information security, pure terms, we look at them through the CIA triad, which is concerned with confidentiality, integrity, and availability so making sure that the information and the information systems remain confidential that the information contained on them remain has the same integrity as you go along and finally that you have access to these when you need to have access to them um, confidentiality is defined as the ability to protect our data from those that are not authorized to view it. And uh, we call, uh, whenever you hear the word compromise, that is generally, um, that's generally saying that uh, you have a breach of confidentiality. So this could be something like you lose a laptop. It could be something like you get shoulder surfed. Um, you could hit reply all in an email and all of a sudden you have uh, confidential data leaked just because it was already in the email chain. Uh, integrity is the ability to prevent people from, may, uh, from changing your data in an unauthorized or undesirable manner. And these are generally called failures. Um, it's kind of hard to find like easy, quick examples like you would for confidentiality or you would for um, availability, but an easy way to think about it is a malicious actor uh, could alter data that changes a decision that someone makes. And a prime example of that today is if you look at, we well, we have a pandemic at the moment. And with the pandemic, if someone is able to make um, any kind of a change to 
uh, a file that impacts how someone gets uh, healthcare decisions made for them. They could go on a ventilator too early and that could cause lung damage, or they could never go on to a vent ventilator when they need to go on to a ventilator. Um, none of this has happened, but it's an easy example for you to get behind. Uh, then there's availability, which is the ability to access our data when we need it. And generally, you will hear these uh, talked about in terms of issues. So GitHub had issues last week where the site was becoming harder and harder to reach. So they are issues, and they could come from various different sources. You could have power losses, and there could be lag to the backup generators kicking up, or you might not have enough battery capacity to bring it up. Uh, you could have a network outage uh, where, for whatever reason, you lose connectivity to the internet, or you could have issues with your application that just constantly crashes the application. There's also the Parkery and Hexad, which is my kind of preference for these. Uh, the idea behind the Hexad is that it's designed to talk about things in terms of cybercrime, um, but I kind of think it's brilliant in that it allows you to discuss so much more of information security without having to worry about, uh, for example, in confidentiality, that's linked with, uh, pos uh, confidentiality is linked with uh, possession in some ways. So if you have encrypted hard drives and you lose possession of the hard drives, the data remains encrypted. You don't have a breach of confidentiality, but you have lost possession. It gives you the, the ability to talk about these things in greater depth. And this is from a guy called Don Parker, who has been working in information security since the 70s or 80s. And he wrote a book in the early 90s about cybercrime when um, I don't really think anyone else was thinking about it. So these are these two theories kind of go way back in terms of the history of these. And it's a really, they're really interesting as to how well they've held up today over time and remain kind of the standard that you would go to for these. Um, integrity means a little bit different to what it means in the CIA triad because the CIA uh, assumes that data manipulation is authorized. So if you're a database administrator and you make a change to the database, it's assumed that, you know, well, you're, that's your job. You're doing what you're supposed to do with your job. There's no big deal to that. But um, Parker cares more about integrity in terms of incorrect or malicious modification of data. So this allows you to discuss insider threats in that you could have a disgruntled employee who decides um, that, you know, well, I'm going to get fired. I'm going to destroy a database and really degrade a company's capability to function. Um, where uh, as well as that, you know, you could still have malicious modification of data, uh, which this then allows you, it expands the number of threats that you can then consider under uh, integrity. And it also allows you to consider mistakes because if you, for example, um, I did this recently where I changed an SSH config and broke access to a server, um, that's, that's just a mistake, it happens, but it is still, because it is an undesirable manipulation of the data, uh, it still falls into a breach of integrity. Uh, then there's possession. It's sometimes also called control. You'll see the two of them used interchangeably. And this is the physical disposition on which the media is stored. So it allows you to discuss data loss without necessarily discussing confidential confidentiality. As I said, if you lose encrypted hard disks, well, okay, you've lost the hard disk. That sucks, but it's encrypted, so there's no real loss to it. Um, then there's authenticity, which allows you to uh, it allows you to attribute uh, uh, words. It allows you to say that you've attributed to uh, the data in question to the proper owner or creator. Um, this uh, this kind of falls into the area of access controls. But an easy way to think about these things without thinking about like something more complicated like access controls is phishing domains. Uh, it is very easy for uh, you to figure out um, it, where, uh, so say, for example, if I send you an email, I have DKIM and SPF set up, so that email arrives in your inbox, it will it only arrive if those keys are there and that the, your email client can verify that that email actually came from me through those two, two methods. So that allows you then to authoritatively say that this message is authentic and does come from me. It basically allows you to discuss integrity in terms of data that you do not own or store.
And then finally, there is utility, which is how useful the data is to you. So if you lose encrypted hard disks and they're found, well, that's of very little use to an attacker or an unauthorized person. But the same cannot be said for unencrypted disks. And especially so if you have some kind of trade secret or something else information that you guys need for the functioning of your company stored on those disks. Um, Generally as well in information security, there are only four types of attacks and all the other attacks fall against them. Uh, the first of these is interception, which are attacks that allow you on, on, uh, allow unauthorized users to access your data, applications or environments. So if you have uh, the ability to uh, make an unauthorized file copy or view a file that you shouldn't be viewing, uh, that is an interception, but it can also be eavesdropping on phone calls. Um, these are generally only against data uh, attacks at data at rest or data in motion, and generally it only impacts confidentiality. Then there's interruption, which is attacks that make your assets unusable on a temporary basis. So um, if you run a failed exploit against a database, that, that uh, might not give you root access or whatever you were looking from the exploit, but it could lead to data loss or corruption or take a database offline for a period of time or permanently. So because it can impact the underlying data and change it in undesirable ways, it can impact integrity and because it can take things offline, it impacts availability as well. Um, then there are modification attacks, which involve tampering with assets. So this would be if uh, you have a service config uh, and you modify it, uh, that, can, that changes the integrity of that file, so that file is no longer the same. But uh, it can also impact availability, as I said, with something like SSH, where if you change the SSH configuration in such a way, you can prevent being able to access that in future. So you're changing file, the f underlying file, that's an impact in integrity. And because you can take stuff offline, that impacts availability as well. And then finally, there's fabrication attacks, which are attacks that involve generating data, processes, communications. Um, this kind of falls into like things like, um, these are a little bit like harder to wrap your head around. The easiest one that I can think of is something like a coin miner, which will consume additional CPU cycles and generate additional processes and network traffic. But um, it can also cause uh, system crashes if uh, the coin miners settings are set too aggressively to generate coin, uh, whatever cryptocurrency they're generating. So because it is changing the underlying file system and adding something to it, it impacts the integrity of the system. And because it can take things offline, it can impact availability. These kind of attacks are generally utilized by threats, which are uh, things that have the potential to cause harm to you. So for example, in a Windows environment, a weaponized version of Bluekeep, which really dates this talk, um, has the potential to cause massive damage, but in a Linux environment, it won't do anything whatsoever. Um, threats utilize vulnerabilities, which are uh, weaknesses or holes that threats can exploit to cause you harm. Generally, they're specific to an operating system, an application, physical location. Um, physical location kind of has a lot of different meanings to it. So you could have inadequate data center cooling, for example, or you could have too few backup generators, something along those lines. And finally, uh, there's a risk that all of these things could happen, which is just the likelihood that one of these bad things will happen. And as well as that, um, uh, some people do and some people don't consider impact as part of this, which is um, impact is a way to calculate the damage that an attack could do by weighing up the value of the asset to you, the uh, Th the likelihood that the threat will succeed and um, uh, finally the risk that they could do. And you generally uh, weigh up the impact through looking at the vulnerability. So if you look at this, this is a CVSS 2.0 score. Um, the idea behind this is that uh, this is a 10.0 on the scale where you have uh, a really bad exploit that is the worst that you could possibly get. And it does that because the access is remote via the network. The complexity of access is quite low. The authentication for it, there is none. And it will impact the confidentiality of the data you store, the integrity of the data you store, and the availability of the data and the systems. 
Um, this is all part of the risk management process, which is the continuous process of dealing with risks to information and information systems. The idea is that you uh, identify the risks, or sorry, you identify the assets, figure out all of the different assets you have in your system, then you identify the threats th uh, through threat modeling and figure out which ones you need to deal with the most. Then you assess the vulnerabilities in your own systems. Uh, then you assess the risks that a threat can use one of these vulnerabilities against one of your assets, and then you figure out how to mitigate them. Generally, this is done through patching a system to remove a vulnerability, but certain systems in production you may not be able to patch, so you might need to uh, uh, decide, do you need to take assets offline, or do you need to remove them from internet-facing systems, or is there something you can do through threat modeling to figure out ways to mitigate a threat? And the idea is just take the risk and drop the risk so that you present the lowest profile to an attacker. Uh, as well as this incident response for all of this is generally a good idea because either poor risk management or emerging threats will lead to a failure and you will fail at some point. So you will need some form of incident response. The idea behind this is that you have prepared to respond to all of this. So you have a plan in place for what to do when all of this happens. You have an active uh, detection and monitoring center, which allows you to detect any attacks and well any issues that arise and decide are they uh, are they attacks that need to be investigated if you do reach the stage where you believe you've been attacked you then need to be able to contain or quarantine these systems take them uh, off the network and make sure that you can eradicate whatever was on them uh, so that they can go back into the environment safely recover these systems then um, through whatever process you use, whether that's imaging or backups. And then finally, do some form of post-incident activity as a post-mortem of the attack. So you can look at what you did good, what you did bad, and what you can improve for the next time. And, and this is another ongoing process that you'll see. So um, information security is a really broad area. It is a large number of topics. Um, I'm only going to skim through the vast majority of these, but um, and I'm not going to touch uh, cryptography because Sean has uh, done a lecture, and I think there might be another one on that. Um, and then as well as that, uh, compliance laws and regulations. I would love to be able to talk a little bit more about that, but um, it's, it's very hard to find a, a European perspective on these things. A lot of the books are written from an American perspective with American perspectives on law, even international law that doesn't kind of meld too well with how things are in Europe. So um, I'd love to find a book on that, but I can't really find anything good on it. So the first thing to talk about is identification. This is who we claim to be. So if you go to twitter.com and try and log in as legendary Patman, that is your identity. And you provide supporting documentation, which is to say that uh, you put you can put in my password and you can then that's your supporting documentation for it. You could also try to put in a fake password and that's false supporting documentation. These then go to an authentication system, which is used to establish if a claim of identity is true. So you put in the password. Is the password the correct password? Well, you get to be taken to the two-factor login screen for me, or um, you get rejected and you have to put in another password. Uh, Authentication is generally concerned with f factors uh, or the use of multiple factors. The most common one that people are used to is something you know, which is your password. Um, the next most common after that is probably a toss up between something you have. So you have a hardware encryption key or you have uh, your phone with an authentication app on it or something like that, or you have uh, something you are, which is a biometric. Um, if you could talk to me about that, I really only think there are two biometrics with maybe a third, which is uh, passwords and then like a hardware token or something like that. Um, and then arguably your location. Um, banks are big fans of using the location because if you use an ATM here in Dublin and then an hour from now you use an ATM in Russia, very unlikely you'll get to Russia in an hour from Ireland. 
so there are also um, behaviors and heuristics that you can use for these, like your gait as you walk, but gait can be spoofed quite easily and I can show you how to do it. Um, so I, I kind of stay in the camp that there are other factors, but they are much, much weaker by comparison to something you know and something you have. You can also add security to authentication systems with multi-factor authentication, which is where you use more than one of these at a time, or mutual uh, authentication in higher security environments. So for example, uh, PGP is a great example of this, where I share with you my public key and you share with me your public key. And between the two public keys, uh, if you send me an encrypted email, I can then authoritatively say that, ah, yes, this is so and so. When the when you're then author, uh, sorry, when you are authenticated, you're then authorized to do certain things, which is that this is the process of authent of. Uh, determining what an authenticated user can do. And it's generally controlled by some form of access control. So staying with Twitter, I log into Twitter. I shouldn't be able to tweet from Sean's account or anyone else's account. I should only be able to tweet from my account. And um, if I change the username once I'm logged in, I shouldn't be able to then all of a sudden be someone else and pretend to be them like banking systems did in Ireland when we started doing online banking. Uh, it, it's making sure that you're restricted to just what you should be able to do. As I mentioned, these are done through access controls. Um, these just control uh, the access that a user has to a system. And they generally are along the lines of you're granted or allowed to do something or denied, or you have limited access to something or you, you had access and that was then revoked. And this is another ongoing part of the risk management process. So you might decide that um, more controls in a certain area is a way to mitigate a threat, for example. And the idea behind it is you have an application there on the left and that has its data stored in its own sandbox. And if that wants to go through, uh, say in an AWS setting, if you wanted to access uh, an S3 bucket, well, you'd need to set up the permissions in AWS to allow that server out to an S3 bucket and limit it to just the S3 bucket that it needs to. Uh, but you could go forward and do uh, multiple other different things with it. There, that's just one limited example of this. And you could do the same with uh, application two, if you wanted that to go to a different bucket or if you wanted to do something else, or if you had it in its uh, a VPC or something and you wanted that then to be exposed to the rest of the internet. And um, these access controls are generally put in lists uh, known as ACLs or ACLs. Um, there's different models for thinking about these. There's DAC or discre discretionary access control, which is the standard Windows version. So if you create a file now on your desktop and you go and look at the permissions of it, you can change the permissions whenever you want. Then there's Mac or mandatory uh, access control, which is more like uh, domain administration in Windows systems, where uh, an administrator has the ability to say who does and who doesn't own such a file. Um, so you might have you you might create a file and not be able to edit the file. Then there are rule-based systems where, uh, like a GPO in Active Directory, where you say there are certain rules that uh, everyone in a group or everyone in a company must meet. And if you meet these, you get this bit of access and that bit of access and so on and so forth. Then there's a rule-based. Uh, this could be something like a uh, pseudo, where for example, because you're in the pseudo group, you have the capacity to have administrative privileges and just purely by your being in a be having the role of the pseudo, you have full administrative privileges. And then there's attribute. This one is a little bit more difficult to explain because it kind of sounds like role-based uh, and rule-based. And that's basically what it is. You have some form of attribute that is above the rules or rules that allow you access to something. So a CEO might, well, it doesn't really need domain administrative privileges for anything, but you know it's very hard to tell your CEO no. So by virtue of them having the attribute, that just goes above and beyond the rest of all the different bits of access control that you have and gives them the access that they need. <clears throat> and then finally, 
there's multiple different levels to this. So you can integrate multiple different levels in different ways. If you're ever on a Windows domain system, they can have various different integrations of Mac rule and role-based systems. Um, if you've ever looked into how US intelligence stores classified information, that's a combination of uh, top-down Mac and bottom-up DAC. There's lots of different ways to look at these things. You can integrate them in various different ways. You can choose to do them whatever way you want. Even in Linux systems, um, you can have the role of sudo, but you can be put into groups with administrative privileges that aren't sudo. Um, and you can do that by give, they have the role as well as they're in a group. Uh, as well as that, Accountability is really important uh, because you need to be able to hold your users account for what they do on your systems. The idea behind this is that you have non-repudiation, which is to say that you've created a series of authoritative records that cannot be refuted. Um, and it provides a, uh, some degree of deterrence from users doing bad things on your network in that they know they're going to be monitors and whatever they do will be found out. And you can do this through a series of uh, intrusion detection and prevention systems. And whatever kind of non-repudiatable records you create, they need to be created in some way that's admissible in a legal setting if you need to go to court. So if you're doing a forensics examination using something like N NCASE or FTK, which are recognized by the Irish court system, is probably a pretty good idea if you're doing a forensics examination. Um, and then there's auditing. So, OK, you have your accountability set up, but um, how do you know what is happening with your accountability records. You need to audit them. Um, so this is just examining and reviewing the uh, digital accounting records. So logging the records um, and then searching and monitoring through these. Uh, some people also consider uh, vulnerability assessments and pen tests, that kind of thing, um, to be a form of auditing because you're auditing whether or not your security controls work. I'm a bigger fan of putting them into a different area just on purely assessing um, your own security, but we'll get to that in a minute. The idea behind doing these tests is that they're recurring assessments that help you resist attacks and it helps you fill gaps in your risk management profile. Uh, onto a different area, away from kind of more theory-based areas, mobile and embedded security, uh, internet of things, that kind of thing. And it's, it's literally everything that isn't a laptop, desktop, or security appliance that is some form of a computer and has some form of a connection to the internet. Um, this is an area of security generally concerned with the deployment of these and the issues around these devices. So on the mobile front, um, all mobile devices have baselines. The baselines are terrible. They're some of the worst coded things imaginable, but there's nothing you can do about it because mobile, like mobile phone networks are the most hacked together bodge job you've ever seen in your life. Um, you could have jailbroken users on your network and um, Jailbreaking is cool, but it also requires giving root permission to your device, which leaves you open to exploit. Um, and there are malicious apps on even legitimate app stores like Google Play or the Apple App Store. Um, so you kind of need to be aware of these different issues and be able to limit the attack surface that you kind of pre present with mobile devices. Then there is embedded devices, which are types of devices that have computers in them, but don't present themselves as computers generally. So if you look at a factory, a factory is essentially a giant industrial control system. A factory is essentially a big computer, but it's not a computer because it's so much more. ATMs are another great example of that, where you know you have the Windows interface in front of you, but all of that is controlled by an embedded computer behind that, and then it spits money at you, or you know, so we would hope. Um, Embedded systems generally are very hard to update or you can't update them for various different reasons or they run some form of legacy system that doesn't work. A great example of this running in the background is the American unemployment system at the moment. A pile of it is run off Fortran or sorry, COBOL systems from 40 plus years ago and there is very few people around who still speak and practice and can do COBOL to keep these systems running. So you have a pandemic, you have a lot of unemployed people, all of a sudden it gets very difficult to keep an embedded system like that up and running. And then finally, there is the Internet of Things, which is 
everything that isn't mobile are embedded. Um, th this is really broad. It covers things like smart devices, like for some reason a fridge with the TV built into it, or things like um, a, a smart lock, which are terrible. Um, and generally, these suffer from the same issues as embedded devices in that they're very difficult to patch. Um, they're generally never updated. But as well as that, they also have another problem, which is you could have tons of these on your network and never know about them. So how do you secure yourself when you leave that much of an open space? A great example of that is the target hack in the US where um, the attackers uh, skimmed a pile of credit card information at, uh, I believe it was Thanksgiving or Christmas or something like that, a big time where there was lots of spending anyway. And they were able to skim all of this information off the credit card readers by getting in through the HVAC system. HVAC system, well, that's not a regular computer or anything like that. That's an Internet of Things device. Uh, then there's also the application security side of things, which is the process of protecting your applications against different security threats that exploit vulnerabilities. Um, it's concerned with protecting the development of uh, your system, vulnerabilities in your system, uh, designing secure websites and web apps that function correctly, as well as securing the databases and detecting the issues around your application with various different tools. So you could use a vulnerability scanner um, apart from the vulnerability assessment, or you could use a fuzzer or something like that to make sure that your application remains secure with time. Uh, Imperva have a really handy thing that breaks down in detail there that I've linked uh, if you want to learn more about, um, for example, web application security. And then, as I mentioned, assessing security, which is validating that your security processes work through testing. Um, as mentioned, vulnerability assessments and pen testing, but you could do this with bug bounties, but also making like testing your own systems internally to make sure that whatever you do is actually secure. So and, and whatever you do with this testing, it needs to be realistic. So um, if you if you're familiar with the NIST cybersecurity framework, uh, that lists four different types of companies that start with companies who have essentially no security or ad hoc security where certain things are secured, but there's no actual formal program. There's no series of policies or anything. They, then there are companies that have started to begin the road to becoming aware of their own risks, the threats against them and how they protect themselves. Then there are companies who are aware of these, have integrated programs and actually start functioning to actively secure them. And then there are companies who are able to do all that the previous companies have done and contribute back to the community to help improve everyone. So if you're at the very bottom rung and you don't have any serious security setup or anything like that, is a realistic test getting some of the best penetration testers in the world to come and break into your systems and see what they can get out of them? Not really. Yeah, they'll get in and, you know, hopefully your pen testers don't get in. But if you don't have a formal process set up where you can actually secure these kinds of systems in a formal way through procedures, it's very difficult for you to actually have had a realistic test and know how secure you are. Um, and as well as that, you have to be aware that security is a fluid concept. Right this second, I would like to think I'm doing a pretty good job of security. But, you know, in an hour from now, uh, a vulnerability come out or um, that leaves me vulnerable or um, I don't know, like uh, something could like anything could happen in the future. And what what is the case today is not the case tomorrow, essentially. And you need to be aware of that and integrate that into your risk management processes. There's also a few areas where I want to dig a little deeper into. Uh, the first of these is network security. And the idea of this is making networks resistant to attacks by using secure, redundant design and monitoring network activities. Um, I'm going to use this diagram again because it also shows you a uh, submented network with access controls between different subnets. Um, that permissions engine is also a choke point, and choke points are ideal for uh, firewalls, packet filtering, or inspection. So 
with that, it's the, the idea is that at choke points, you can put in uh, places where you can detect what's happening on the network. So if you if all your application servers one run in one sandbox, you would have a series of network cables that come out, go to a choke point, and then from the choke point, you can monitor everything going in and out to that. That then segments your network, creates a choke point to allow you to monitor it. That's pretty good way it's a much broader topic when it comes into secure network design with redundancy and all that but as a kind of basic introduction this is a really easy way to think about it um, if you are protecting your traffic you need to be able to use uh, secure protocols so using ssh over telnet https over http um, you should also use vpns because uh, they allow you to and i know that might come as a shock to some of the people who've seen my other talks but um, vpns are really handy when you deploy them yourself and they're great for keeping your users at your company inside your trust boundary because while they're in the VPN, they have never actually left your network and you can monitor them and then their activity through the different steps. Um, and then you can use tools like scanners to figure out, um, are you using secure protocols or are there unsecure protocols open? You can use seam tools to then monitor all the different traffic and have it coming in and out and figure out, um, is there anything malicious happening or figure out what a baseline of normal traffic looks like. And there's, there's tons of different tools that you can use to kind of figure out how to protect your traffic. Then there's operating system security, which is the process of decreasing your attack surface, um, uh, that, the attack surface that an attacker can use against you. Um, it's generally done through hardening, which is the removal of unnecessary software. I have a Razer laptop. The first thing I did was remove that stupid RGB software. Um, you might want to remove unnecessary services. A lot of Windows computers have uh, port 135 open for NetBIOS all the time for some reason. Um, if things come with default accounts like Cisco routers, you would want to change the default passwords on the Cisco routers. Uh, Windows also has a um, technically a default account, but that account becomes most people's regular account. So it's a good idea to use least privilege and create a new account for yourself and um, set that set a new password for that one and run as the lower privilege account when it, on, until you need to actually install something. Um, Perform updates on these things, turn on Windows Update, or if you're on Linux servers or something like that, using unattended upgrades and customize it to your needs. And then log and audit the different things on your systems. All of these things are great, but um, if you're not logging what's happening on the computer and auditing the logs occasionally, you're never going to know what's actually truly going on. Uh, you should also protect against malware on these systems. Uh, this is generally done through using antivirus with software firewalls and uh, host intrusion detection systems. Um, or if like me, you are not a fan of uh, antivirus software and you have a pile of money to spend, you could use EDR systems with a software firewall, which will allow you to do more like a better version of antivirus at greater cost. Uh, as well as this, you also need to be able to protect uh, any executable space where, because um, pro programs can't just execute anywhere, they can only execute at certain points in memory. So um, generally this requires a combination of hardware and software to work. So if you look at ASLR, address-based layout randomization, um, that requires uh, hardware on your Intel AMD or ARM chip, as well as uh, having uh, software in Windows or in uh, Linux or anything else that allows you to utilize the ASLR. The goal of that is it moves around where memory sits or where things sit in memory. So when you turn off your computer, they're always in a new place. It stops them being uh, stops there being a reliable place that attackers can exploit to break into various different parts of your systems. Then there is CHOP, which is, if I remember rightly, structured exception handling, something or other. And the idea behind it is, um, the idea behind CHOP is that it prevents uh, overflows of buffers and stacks by making sure that if um, someone does try to do something with uh, either the stack or um, uh, 
if someone tries to do something with the stack, it'll basically result in an exception being called that will prevent that from going forward. And then there's DEP or data execution prevention, which prevents programs from executing different things in unexecutable space. This is generally a protection against ROP or return oriented programming, where you would create a series of program snippets and um, those snippets then uh, linked together in a chain and at the end of the chain is some piece of shell code that you want to actually attack and um, Craig has failed to join there Sean yeah you just messaged me there I'm like Jesus Craig I've been unexpectedly disconnected how dare you Craig I'll fight Craig I'm gonna take Craig on all right let me just try again I'll just I'll just add to fuck the uh things together with magic now recording there we go all right I see so, <laughs> cool so um all of these kind of things have uh, been pretty common between information security and cyber security so what separates information security from cyber security um Information security is concerned with operation security or OPSEC. And OPSEC is the idea uh, where you minimize your attack surfaces and single points of failure through proper habits and policies. And habits aren't something that computers have. Habits are something that people have. So while human element security is an important thing that I'm going to get onto in a moment, Operation security is concerned with when these people are traveling or when these people are communicating or when these people are using applications or depending on what you know kind of industry you, you work in, if you have to deal with intelligence services, being able to uh, put the proper habits in place for your staff that they can communicate securely, uh, securely or they can uh, move from place to place securely or you know if they need to implement counterintelligence or something along those lines. Uh, the process for operational security is pretty uh, similar to uh, how you would have risk management, but it's uh, more concerned with critical information. So uh, information systems can be people or computers or hard drivers or something. So you might decide that, okay, this person is critical information. There are a number of threats against these uh, this critical information. There are vulnerabilities to this uh, critical information in that this person might have to move somewhere or that we might have to, I don't know, put like a, a container filled with hard drives and ship them to Amazon so they can put them into Glacier for us or something like that. Um, so you need to then look at the vulnerabilities that exist and then uh, figure out what the risks are that uh, something could go wrong with this and then apply whatever countermeasures can be applied to it. So you might issue guidance on traveling to specific countries or something like that. And when you're in uh, specific companies, how to move between whatever meetings you're going to or whatever sites you're going to or whatever else you're doing there. Um, the process is very similar, as I mentioned, to risk management, but in risk management, it's only concerned with information information system, but it fa fails to deal effectively with the physical realm or with assets like humans who cannot be treated like other information systems. It's not too easy to tell humans um, that they have to abide by policies which are very easy to make computers abide by. Um, human element security as well. This is the weakest link generally in your security. They're this weirdly unpatchable, vulnerable group of things that accidentally leak information and there's nothing you can do to prevent this. But you can limit the attack surface that you have. Uh, you can go through a process of intelligence gathering, generally through human intelligence, which is intelligence you gathered through people, essentially. Or you can go through open source uh, intelligence, which is where you can gather intelligence from publicly available data. Uh, you could look at, for example, job postings, and you could figure out that something is going on at a company or that they're making a major change to how they do something at the company. Or you know, if there's something they didn't want you to talk about, you might accidentally have that on. Uh, uh, you're uh, in a job posting or something like that. Uh, same goes for social media. A great example of that is uh, after Edward Snowden leaked uh, a pile of his information, one of the first things that people started doing was going to LinkedIn and starting to put in keywords like PRISM and X key score and seeing how many NSA employees they could just find randomly because they were talking about classified programs on social media. 
Uh, you could also use uh, public records. Um, so if you have a public company, your company will have to issue certain kinds of things um, to shareholders every year. Uh, and you can go through these and figure out maybe are they making this change or the, is there this piece of technical intelligence you can glean from reading this information, that kind of thing. You can also go and do Google dorking or Google hacking where you can use a certain number of um, search terms to find, for example, PDFs that are openly available on the website and see if you can find them at any interesting domain names or if they have any interesting information. You can check the file metadata because while most people think of file metadata in terms of their location data is stored in a photo, um, if you create a Word document on a Windows share, it will tell you the author of that document. It will tell you that that, that author will not just be like for me in terms of Patrick Hurley, it would have me in terms of my network identity, which will give you an idea of what the emails to get access to the company are, for example. So it could be like P. Carley or it could be uh, Paddy K or whatever else like that there. Uh, as well as that, it can tell you, uh, Windows metadata can go as far as telling you what uh, share this thing was created on and what file or uh, what mount point that share is at um, lots of different various bits of uh, information as you go along with that you can then use Shodan or my personal favorite census to sit there and uh, gather information about various different systems that they may or may not have um, that a company may or may not have looked at. So you can find, uh, for example, a server that is online connected to the network and being used for something who knows, but never came up in uh, inventory IDs. And you could use that one as an entry point to attack. Uh, you can then use Multigo as well to put all of this information together and uh, create neat little graphs that allow you to figure out connections between different things. So you could connect someone's social media to um, some file metadata and figure out where a server is that you can then connect to Shodan and Census and figure out that this one is online. And then all of a sudden you have a ton of information about what the internal state of a company looks like. There are other avenues like that. Uh, it's not just limited to that. There's geospatial intelligence, um, which is if you follow me on Twitter is what I do a lot of just looking at satellite imagery. You can figure out if they're building extensions or if they're doing something else that might be of use to you. You could do measurement intelligence, um, not really applicable in information security, but it kind of sits there. You might need to measure different things for some reason. Signals intelligence, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth radios being aware that they're there and being able to deal with them, very handy. Technical intelligence, so if they have, if a company is switching programming languages or something like that, that might be because they're undertaking a new massive project, useful to know about that. Uh, financial intelligence, um, they might publish various different things and put things in financial reports that they're uh, transitioning different things they do in the company that might be of use and then there's cyber intelligence which i kind of it's lumped in with open source intelligence and it's basically the same thing they've become very similar but it's basically the cyber aspect of open source intelligence um, this can all be used for social engineering so you can form a pretext um, based on all of this information to have a pretext to communicate with the target you can then use phishing to have uh, with that pretext to have a target compromise themselves or you could figure out that secu physical security is lax so you could tailgate someone through a physical access control point um, it's also concerned with uh, security awareness training. Uh, I was at a conference when we were still lucky enough to be able to have in-person conferences, and they were talking about uh, security awareness training. And one of the things they talked about was how it takes the average human three to five attempts to actually soak up the information given to you. So if it takes three to five attempts for people to take your password information online or your social engineering defenses online, you kind of need to be doing these in a regular fashion and make sure that people are up to date with all of these. So you could do it on passwords and two-factor authentication, social engineering, as I mentioned, um, how they should use the network. There are certain things you might and might not want them to do on the network. You might want to educate them about what to do about malware if uh, malware ends up on their computer. If they're bringing their personal equipment to work, what they can do with the personal equipment and what kind of um, controls you might have on the um, uh, what kind of controls you might put on their personal devices to make sure that that's the case. Um, 
you might also have a clean desk policy where you don't when you go home at the end of the day you have nothing left on your desk but i don't know your keyboard your mouse and your monitor and the thin client that you use there's no files or anything they're put locked in filing cabinets um, and then also familiarity with uh, company policy and regulatory knowledge uh, f uh, then there's also physical security, which is security measures that you put in place to protect people, equipment, and facilities. Uh, this is an area of security with its own group of threats. So um, you could wor uh, be worried about movement, things moving fast. They could be pretty bad if uh, you step out in front of a car at 120 kilometers an hour. Have fun with that. Um, smoke and fire. Uh, I'm not familiar with either computers or people doing well in either very smoky environments or environments with fire uh, toxins. I don't think heroin impacts computers, but I know it impacts people. Pretty sure because there's like a water base to it, it fucks people too. Um, people are terrible, so people are also a threat. Um, energy anomalies, you could have uh, electricity surges. Um, people don't do good when electrocuted, neither do computers. Um, you could have extreme temperatures. What you tend to find is um, you get too cold, computers and people stop working, and you get too hot, computers and people stop working. Uh, gases. Uh, people need a certain balance of gases in the air to be able to breathe and survive. Computers, not so much so, but you know, if you filled an entire, I don't know, computer room filled with, I don't know, hydrogen, I don't think computers would do too well in there either. Um, too much liquids, uh, pretty bad. Uh, generally, things need to be kept at a humidity level in data centers for computers to run at their highest performance. So, you know, you're going to start degrading performance if that humidity goes outside the bounds, or if you have a flood. Uh, computers generally don't survive floods, and people don't do too well in them either. You could have living organisms like, oh, I don't know, a pandemic. Um, and then there's projectiles. So um, I shoot a computer. Computer's not going to have a good day. Someone shoots me, I'm not going to have a good day. There are a number of controls that you can do for this. Um, they break down into deterrent controls, which are, are generally signs uh, that warn you of different things, or maybe a dog as well. You might not want to break into a building that has a giant angry Alsatian outside it or something like that. You can have detective controls, which are basically um, uh, IDS systems for physical systems, such as um, uh, door opening sensors, motion sensors, temperature change sensors, that kind of thing. And you have them set up in such a way that if you enter an environment, you can detect that someone is in the environment. And then there's preventive controls, which are things like security guards who can physically stop someone from getting into a building or locks, which in theory prevent people, but I can teach you how they don't prevent people, um, but they are a preventative control. If you do want to protect information in the physical systems, you need to be able to protect people because people are hard to replace and do not do well against physical threats. And um, also data systems, because data systems generally tend to suffer when a physical threat becomes too grave. What you tend to find is uh, data systems require a certain range with which they work in. So they can work in an environment with a certain amount of temperature, but once you go too high or too low in that, various different things happen that may mean that um, the system stop functioning. Or uh, in the case of something like data, uh, magnetic data storage, if you keep that around extremely high voltages for long enough, it will start to change the data on the hard drives. You also need to be worried about protecting the location. So um, you need to model for physical threats against your site. So whatever you're, wherever you choose to put your site, you need to make sure that uh, your building isn't going to be vulnerable to natural disasters, say. You need to be able to have secure access. So you have defense in depth coming into it. You might have a long road leading into your data center where you have protections at the entry to the facility. You have a protection at the entry to the parking. And then when you get to the front door, you have protections at the front door. And then even once you go beyond that, further protections again. Um, you also want a secure environment. So you want to make sure that you have adequate data center cooling, that you have adequate backup generators, uh, all that different kind of good stuff so that in the event that things go wrong, um, you need to make sure that they're able to continue to function. So 
Um, I'm just going to cover some notes and terminology before wrapping up because I mentioned data at rest and data in motion. Um, data at rest is pretty simple and self-explanatory, but I think it's useful for everyone to get it, uh, to understand it, which is that it is data that's not in the process of being moved from one place to another. And data in motion is data that is moving from one place to another. I also mentioned policies. Um, policies are high level statements from management saying that, um, saying what is and what isn't allowed in an organization. I didn't mention it, I don't think, but um, policies are generally derived from standards and standards dictate what will be used to carry out a policy. So if you look at a standard like uh, uh, ISO 27001, that lays out a, that standard lays out a number of things that you must do and you implement those standards through a series of policies. And then you will also have procedures, which I mentioned as well, which is a description of how exactly you will go about doing a thing. So if you have the procedure to, um, I don't know, update your HTTPS certificates, um, if you are not doing that by CertBot and it's only the kind of thing you need to do once a year, pretty good idea to have a uh, certificate or like a procedure laid out to generate the encryption keys that you need for that because you would want to make sure if that thing's going to be implemented for a year probably without changing you want to make sure that it's going to function with time uh, and then finally sources and resources and um, I mentioned this at the start the foundations of information security by Dr. Jason Andres this is probably my favorite security book ever written it genuinely makes me smile it is hugely interesting entertaining and fun it's written in an enjoyable way he does a really good job of ex explaining the concepts and um, if you want to start to begin to get an in-depth understanding of um information security and how it applies and how important it is to you and your work going forward highly recommend this book as well as that, um, I always provide a little bit of further reading. So if you do want to dive a little deeper, um, Security Engineering by Dr. Ross Anderson, it's about a thousand pages and it'll probably be about 50 quid. And I know that's a lot of pages, but this covers information security in depth from every perspective, covering probably anything you could possibly imagine. And provides in-depth guides to securing systems. Um, this is the cover of the third edition, which isn't out yet. I hope it's out this month, but uh, his timeline has slipped a little since uh, uh, the pandemic came about. I'm also going to put a few more um, recommendations up on Twitter as well, because I've started to read a lot more of books on this kind of topic area since I've the time, and there's some really interesting ones as well. And uh, with that, I'm done, so I will take some questions. Craig got a stroke halfway through. Um, literally there at the end, Craig just goes like, ah, no, I'm done. So I hate Craig. Craig's dead to me. Uh, I'm just going to say straight up that was fantastic. I, uh, I'm going to lie, or I'm going to be truthful and say that I was cheating during the entire thing because I have the foundation of information security on front of me. I cracked it open halfway through. And just start like uh, when you were talking, I start looking up the chapters like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So now I, you know. Anyway, let me see, find the first question. Yeah, uh, oh. Zeb has two there. Um, oh, good. Uh, Bellingcat using Massint for one of those Europol things to ID an object. Do you mean like um, the, Europ the Europol pedophile challenge where they give you objects <laughs> and you have to try and link them back? Yeah, okay, so um, I think technically, yes, that is measurement intelligence. The easiest one that I know of uh, to talk about measurement intelligence would be um, the US Air Force has this aircraft called a Cobra Ball. And the idea behind the Cobra Ball is that uh, you fly it above where you know there's going to be a ballistic missile test and through a series of different cameras and radars you can then figure out the acceleration of the rocket of the missile and uh, you can very accurately estimate the height and different parts of it so then you can uh, model the uh, missile nearly in real time and with that kind of model you can figure out what kind of capabilities that rocket has so um if you if you uh when, since you mentioned kim jong-un when north korea tested the wasong 15 which is their big intercontinental ballistic missile 
it very quickly became apparent that, that was a big motherfucker just because of what you could get from measurement intelligence. And uh, where is Kim Jong-un? Excellent question. No one knows. Good luck figuring it out. <laughs> en enjoy the rumor mill. He's actually in the pub. He's taking advantage of it. Um, I'm trying not to get too much to Kim Jong-un. Uh, I was actually just wondering, you were talking about like interruptions where like if you were to attack something, it would just cause yep. it to... Would you be able to give like an example of probably even like what would some that probably uh, work on? But obviously like try not to. go back to the slides and... Mm -hmm. So, uh, interruption. Um, so, uh, if you run... A... Have you ever run MS-08067 uh, against anything? No. Well, basically, if you run that exploit against uh, certain versions of uh, Danger Mouse. Um, if you run that exploit against certain versions of Windows XP and you pick the wrong reverse shell for it, what will happen is it will crash the Windows system rather than giving you the reverse shell you want. So you need a net yeah that one's Efferfish, yeah um so if you use that one against the system you need to know what the right tool to use along with it is because the exploit's only part of it you might attach something to the exploit that doesn't work on the system for various different reasons so that's a really easy one that i'm very familiar with because i fucked it up multiple times in an exam <laughs> what was it that in the last year's pen testing exam or yes it was oh um, i hate that but that was I you. It, yeah, I figured it out pretty quickly. Uh, yeah. Basically, you just need to pick the right shell. You just can't go, oh, yeah, the first interpreter. No, you need to figure out which interpreter works for it. But yeah, it, it basic. Um, but you could do this against various different things. And um, databases can sometimes be finicky things, which just end up getting corrupted because stuff happened. So it's the kind of thing where any kind of an interruption to that can kind of just change how the system functions. So basically, like if you were to like launch a DOS upon on a database, it could possibly even yeah, end it, up it, doing it it could. Usually, it in could my happen. head, it's usually just like, oh, take it down and stop it. They shut it down. So, like, if you're dumb, you could basically just end up with your whole database being corrupted. Yeah. There could be unforeseen consequences. No. Um. There was actually one here I would say uh, for networking ASLs. Uh, just because I was re I saw it in the book, and I'm like, well, I'm gonna ask this. What would be a black hole? Be able to explain what like kind of like black holes are. Uh, so I know them as sinkholes rather than black holes. Um, the idea behind uh, the idea behind that is you would just put an area of nothing into DNS, and uh, every time you get requests, they get forwarded out to this giant pile of nothing. But you might also set that up as a place to collect loads of information. So during the Configure worm, they sent up sinkholes where just vast quantities of Configure-related traffic were sent to servers to be cataloged and logged for analysis. So depending on what you're doing with different things, you can use it in different ways. But the idea is basically um, you start funneling that information out of your environment towards either somewhere for it to go away and die like dev null or somewhere that doesn't exist on your network, or you send it away to something like um, somewhere for collection and analysis. Oh, that just sounds like, uh, honestly, that just sounds like just like, so they basically just have an empty service that just gather all these logs and just do whatever with them. Basically, yeah. Because yeah. like you, like if you're getting attacked by malware and you want to figure out what the malware is doing, you might want to send that tra redirect the traffic or send the traffic permanently somewhere so that you can then start to reverse it and figure out what's going on with it. Mm. Okay, that makes sense. Um, there's another one. Yeah, I saw. I heard you mention like the Irish bank app. What about like uh, what you call it? With, uh, with verification, would you able to go into that one? Like I remember you saying about the early. So. Because I, I, I like hearing banks fuck up. When, when <laughs> I remember when e-banking first came to Ireland and I very quickly jumped on the bandwagon because I was young, naive, and I thought technology would solve all the world's problems and I wasn't old and I wasn't a cynic yet. And basically, <laughs> um, but I, I still knew like little bits of like things that you could do to websites to make bad things happen. Um, mm -hmm. And um, like this is like 2007 or eight or something like that. And basically, um, log into system. The system like 
even for 2007 or eight, it looked like the web page was from 1994. Um, but it was it was total garbage, and I just kind of sat and looked at it, and I noticed that in the URL bar it had web address to bank followed by some like garbage to tell like direct the servers to the right place of where the information was stored and then it had a number and that was it and i was looking at the number wondering what happens if i change that eight to a seven do i see someone else's account and oh no uh, yeah oh yep well you know what? i'm not surprised i'm honestly not surprised they're like no neither am i but <laughs> yeah I always like contribute that like sort of thing that happens. What's it like indirect URL referencing? I can't remember the exact name from like the. Um, it, uh, I think it's right d- uh, direct object reference. That's it. Like That's that. it. I adore. Uh, yeah. I always remember that from the moon. Thank yeah. you, Zeph. Thank you. You're my you're my dictionary because I don't know things. Um, but I always remember that. Do you remember that moon pig? Do you ever hear about that moon pig um, attack or that moon pig thing where they had like an idor reference thing going on? And uh, lots of people's accounts were getting like attacked. This was like I think about two, three, maybe four years ago. Kind of the same Very scenario. Nice. No, well, it was about I think it was three or four years ago. Basically, they had IDOR where everybody's account was like a quote, but basically a string at the end of a URL, and this change of one thing would go to another account. I think I had my ex girlfriend off fuck for that actually. So uh, hope I didn't just dox that. The moon pig bug. Thanks. <laughs> I will be coming uh, back to that later. Amazon had it for you. Oh, dear God, Jesus. I think uh, Steam That's had it as well. disappointing. Oh, no, don't do that on Steam. <laughs> I don't think Steam has any more. Steam to function. <laughs> yeah, loads of shit. Sites yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure loads of stuff is vulnerable yeah. to it. Um, I'm vulnerable to idle. You can turn on your microphones if you want to uh, ask questions or whatever as well, guys. Yeah, uh, I instead can... of just having Sean. Yeah, or you, you could know, just like I'm... write questions. I, I've written a few questions. I'm just going to give pocket everybody permissions to sort of just talk. And if you mess with it, I will mute you. There. Everybody should have permissions to speak. So go ahead. Anyway, I'm just going to continue on actually to another person. Now. Uh, basically, you didn't really go into it. What would you say? Could you explain what kind of hardware keys are? Uh, so stuff like a YubiKey, which is basically a USB a key with uh, an encryption it's a usb key with an encryption key on it and you plug it in wait for the green light push the button and hey presto magic um it uh, authenticates you to a site via uh what's your uh public key encryption so you're authoritatively saying that i am me with this um opinions on 5g i will get to that um <laughs> Uh, like don't forget. <laughs> uh, oh no, it's there in text. Um, but are in chat. Um, so uh, yeah, there's also biometric YubiKeys coming, which I'm probably never ever going to use, and I'm probably <laughs> like if anyone gives them to me, I'm going to like break them with a hammer. I hate. That sounds them. sketchy, though. Well, look, it's. It's one of those things, like, the problem I have with biometrics is biometrics can be, you can be forced to authenticate with biometrics against your will. And there are laws in different countries where, uh, my favorites being New Zealand and the United States, where if you're not a citizen upon entering any of those countries at a border crossing, um, you can be forced to divulge your passwords and under the Fourth Amendment in the United States and the law in uh, uh, New Zealand, you can be forced, if there are biometric two-factor pieces, forced to give up your biometrics against your will to log into those systems. Whereas in both those countries and in nearly every other country I know that has those kind of laws, you cannot be forced to put in your USB key with two-factor authentication and use that. I wonder how they legally get around that whole thing of making you have to plug in your USB and basically give away your data. Um, there's probably some fantastic construct in law that will do that, but I am not a lawyer and I don't know enough about it. I just know that it exists and they talked about it on Risky Biz. We're going to so. have to call legal legal right now. <laughs> go for it. Go for it. Yeah, TJ yeah. McIntyre, he's Ireland's digital lawyer. He's helpful. So I'm going to write that down. I, I'm surprised I didn't know that, but then again, I'm very good at not knowing things. Yeah. Uh, opinions on 5G. Um, it, it, it It's good and bad. Is basically how I'd put it. Um, 
Don't you know it causes coronavirus? <laughs> <laughs> My head. Um, look, the the gist of it is that like it has really promising and interesting technology, um, and like I am a hundred percent on board for really really fast. Um, uh, I, I'm like I'm really on board for anything that makes my internet connections faster. Um, but at the same time, like five G is essentially a bodge on top of four G, which is a bodge on top of two G, or three G, which is a bodge on top of two uh, G, and it basically is um, the same garbage we've had for forty plus years with minor updates to it. I don't really see why we can't sit there and build a better version of the same thing um, that would have less problems in it because there's a bajillion vulnerabilities that have been carried over before you start to get into worries about how the lawful intercept capacity of those could be used for bad like uh, the NSA used in Greece in what was that 2005 uh, yeah 2005 I think it was so basically the NSA were able to get in and use the lawful intercept um, functions in Greek telecommunications hardware to start monitoring certain people in Greece so do you want to have that kind of capacity available to uh, more people because 5G has it with all the same problems of before and all of those vulnerabilities still exist that have never been fixed not really a fan of that to be honest i would prefer if we didn't have it and especially if we did have it if we were forced to have it we didn't have it chinese because if i'm forced to trust the nsa or china i will take the nsa every goddamn day i preferably trust neither of them but you know yourself i'm um, saying if we're forced to i will take the oh, NSA okay, yeah. for china yeah good point um i personally like i'll say with 5g i actually think it's i realized i don't care if that makes sense like, I still trust, like, I still don't want to trust the Chinese government as far as you control them. But, like, at the end of the day, I mean, it's, like, pfft. as long as my data is not being used for anything bad, which it probably is. But, like. Of course it's good. The whole, like, the problem with it is, is, oh, dude. Do you know what the other thing that I hate about 5G, actually, and I forgot to mention, is oh, um, one of the major issues I actually have is an architectural issue with 5G, which is that it, um. 5G, 4G works, and 3G and 2G uh, work the same way that uh, traditional networks work in cybersecurity terms, where you have a pile of different nodes that have something on it, and they all pipe back to a series of choke points. And at those choke points, you have some form of monitoring and stuff like that. Literally, the whole point of 5G is to not have those choke points. So how do you monitor a network where you essentially need to have ids, ips, or firewalls or something else, some monitoring and detection system, not at a centralized location, but at everywhere where there are towers. And because it runs at, a, a, I think 5G runs at higher frequencies as well than 4G does. So it, it has shorter transmission distances. So if you have shorter transmission distances, you need more of them, which brings up the cost of the entire system. Um, and a lot of that's just to make it IoT friendly. But like, I, I don't get why you would want to just like you, you, what, what essentially you're doing by implementing 5G is taking, I don't know what, like 40 years of information security and how we design systems and how we threat model for them and how we do everything with them and take the entire concept take a gigantic fuck off bin and fuck everything into the big bin and go like, oh no, it'll be fine, don't worry about it. And and like as Link says, it comes down to politics of who provides it. Arguably, yes, but th there's more to 5G than just that. You know, like th it, when you're talking about tearing up the playbook of how we have done everything for the longest period of time, I, like I don't think that's the smartest idea, but then most people don't seem to care about that. And I don't know how many people sit there and look at a mobile network like me and just go like, I wonder how I can threat model that. Oh, and then realize you can't because it's 5G and it's a nightmare. That honestly sounds like just convenience over security. Sean. Yeah, I know. On. What's such a crazy thing? <laughs> but you know, that's that's normal. Um, I'm going to quickly move on 
so you don't start burning into you just don't you know turning into 5g and burning yourself um really I gonna... it doesn't matter <laughs> welcome to fort here um I was actually going to say, with the uh, SEG networking thing, isn't that basically just a proxy gateway, what, you're basically, what that basically is? So you'd set that up um, with, uh, you would have different systems running in different subnets, or you would you'd be using different VLANs to separate mm -hmm. different bits of traffic from other bits of, I know there none of those are like solid bulletproof security measures, but you do them as part of a defense in depth strategy where you do as much as possible to separate what an attacker can do from what an attacker can't do. Mm -hmm. No, because in my head, when you were kind of explaining it, and especially with the diagram, it kind of just sounded like one of those, you know, proxy gateway, but like a whatever external firewall or whatever. No, like with the diagram, I use that for convenience because one of the mm -hmm. things that that book does a great job of is it is really simple, quick, easy to understand books are, sorry, ugh, words. It is really quick, simple, easy uh, diagrams that you can wrap your head around. And while that one work is an access control diagram, it works for, um, uh, it works for uh, network design as well, because the, the idea behind it is you, application one, you might have a ton of different servers that actually run application one, but those servers are, um, what you call it, those servers are segmented away on their own part of the network. And for them to get conne uh, any connectivity to anything else, they need to go through this choke point. And that choke point is where there are, say, uh, you might have a firewall there to prevent traffic coming in or out. You might have an IPS there to only allow certain different things to happen on the network. You might want to just monitor everything that's coming in and out of them. Um, and you uh, permissions can also be used as part of network segmentation. So you might say that um, only traffic coming from this computer can go to the management servers for application one, because you don't necessarily want to have everyone in the company have access over SSH to a server for whatever reason. You might only want to limit that to administrators of some description or your DevOps guys or I don't know, whatever else. So the idea of it is, is that like that is a choke point where you can perform a multitude of different operations on it, not just permissions or not just anything else. And because they're on different subnets, you can then put routers in place that can limit the access to be able to get to those subnets in certain ways. So you might not want the two applications to see each other. So you could like put in uh, a rule in the routing table that makes it so that traffic coming from certain places always goes to application one. So these bits of traffic only get, ever get to see application one, never application two. That, uh, that sounds an awful like, especially because, uh, like, just our last assignment, that especially sounds like just what, like, that you can only SSH from certain IP addresses and also SSH out of to a certain IP addresses. That's that's a pretty common way of doing it. Like one of the ways I'm really familiar with uh, SSHing between different things, which I wasn't allowed to do, is where you have a VPN, and if you are on that VPN, uh, that is a fixed address. It doesn't change and as long as you stay on that VPN. You then have access to whatever else you need to in there, and you can have multiple VPNs. Where if you are on the regular company VPN, um you then have access to certain aspects of that. But if you have administrative privileges, you can go in through an administrative part of the VPN and use that to get further access to more of it so you can maintain the systems. And uh, actually, just somebody had a question there. Uh, what do you think about employees using VPNing into work? When you say VPNing into work, uh, do you mean like where you use like hotspot shield in college or do you mean like where your company has a policy where they you have to use their vpn uh site to site um site to site yeah pretty good um i like if you want to use vpns for personal protection i don't think vpns offer the kind of levels of security that uh people think they give you and i think there's a lot of marketing bullshit around them that kind of no one has really thought about or challenged or done anything about. It just kind of sits there in the ether and everyone just accepts it. Um, my favorite one is uh, protect you when you're uh, at a public, um, like if you're in a coffee shop or something and you're on public Wi-Fi. Well, uh, ever since TLS, where one of the main goals of TLS has been uh, you are encrypted from your endpoint to the endpoint of the server, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty good.
you know and okay fair enough you could have man in the middles man in the middles can do bad things about it but um tls 1.3 is coming out in tls one well it's it's already a um, TLS 1.3 fixes a lot of those issues again. So the value of VPNs for personal usage are continually diminishing and diminishing and diminishing. And the only thing they're really good for is piracy, probably, and pretending you're somewhere else because you want Netflix in America. There's actually uh, talk about that. Um, one, I'll say I love those ads because they're all, most of the time, they're absolute horseshoe. But there's actually a great, considering that link we put it up, the Tom Scott thing, there's actually a great Tom Scott video that I'm now going to ask Linky to find again. I think it's like... Just, can we just all agree something. Tom Scott is actually fantastic. Oh, yeah. I've... Uh... I'm trying to give it. But, but like, I'm um, just going to finish his question as well on the site to site thing. Yeah, sorry, for sorry. for your employees, um, uh, for your employees um, when they're in your network, the value that a VPN brings is that allows you to take your trust boundary and extend it wherever it is. So instead of having your trust boundary limited to site A and site B you can connect the two sites over VPN and make sure that that is a single trust boundary, even though it goes over the network, but but that network you have inside it created your own secure one. So it basically results in like VPNs for company usage, especially when you want to keep an eye and monitor your companies or your employees and what they do on it and keep them inside your control. They're very useful for that. Sorry, I was just posting the uh, the actual link there to the VPN thing I was saying. No, I seen that's fine. Yeah, uh, which I totally didn't hear the end bit as a result. Sorry. <laughs> um. Yeah, no. Let me see where I am. Uh, I was gonna. I wrote down for some reason. Are you sure GeoWind is isn't just about rocks? As as someone who recently put up a giant photo of satellite imagery, um, it looks a lot like it's about rocks, but it's about more. Um, yes, I was right. Yeah. <laughs> when, when your hobby is underground um, nuclear facilities in North Korea, uh, you spend a lot of time looking about looking at what are essentially rocks, but it's a bit more than just rocks. <laughs> satellite imagery, basically. <laughs> and, and yes, technically minerals, but I can't look at infrared and radar, like satellite imagery, and say that. Um, oh yeah, that's clearly limestone. That's unfortunately. I love sedimentary. Yes, as do I. Mm, yes, look at that. Look at that stalactite. I don't know my rocks anymore. My uh, geography teacher is fucking. She's hearing me somewhere. She's giving out, uh, but she always did, so it's not new. Uh, I'm going to wait for Zeb to finish his thing, because I think he has a question. I learned my rocks from Minecraft. Anyway. Okay, he's got a good point. Didn't we so all? Did yeah. Um, yes. Uh, anything else, then? Uh, let me see. Uh, can I install Kali on my fridge? Hashtag hacker fridge. Uh yeah, probably it wouldn't surprise <laughs> me. Like there, there's a version of Kali that runs on ARM and embedded systems. So if you can figure, oh well, Zephyrfish has done it. So there you go. Yeah, if you could just figure out what the fuck your fridge runs on, you can run whatever the fuck you want on it. Like, I am honestly not surprised. Yeah, pen yeah, test part, pen, of course, pen test partners have done it. Yep, of course they have. <laughs> the fucking dildo drone. Yeah, they've they've put it on a goddamn fridge. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah. on a serious well, note, how, oh, go on. Sorry, sorry. No, no, you go. On. No, I'm done. That's yeah, you might turn to speak. Uh, but actually, you know, a serious actual question when it comes to the fridges: How often do those like the fridges actually even get even updated? Uh, English. I'm learning it today. Uh, how often do fridges even get updated, if anything? I have no idea, mm. but. The, what basically the problem with IoT things is it basically um, uh, you would hope it's over the air the same as Android, but you, uh, um, the the I I have concerns around that because basically what it boils down to to is that um, IoT like security is already a problem of economics. It comes down to how much resources can you put into the system to secure everything? The risk side of it, economists are really interested in risk at the best of times. Um, that's what a lot of economics is. And when you have something like a fridge 
and you put a whole Android operating system or like your LG and you put um, WebOS into uh, like your TV or something like that. In theory, while they can be updated and they ca could be updated for security, you have a limited number of engineers working on a small product. And a lot of those engineers are not software engineers. Those engineers are there for one thing and one thing only. And that's to design how the TV works or how the fridge works or how the this or the that or the other thing works. So when they're kind of worried about creating the best product and people don't really care for security and don't pay for security, mm -hmm. Um, well done. Um, how do you then choose where to invest your time and effort in for these products to make them come out the way that you want them to come out? Um, you put them into the fridge aspect or the TV aspect and the fact that Netflix works on your TV, not necessarily that you end up in a situation where you prioritize security first. Um, so when that's kind of the way it pans out, Eh, it's not going to work out too great. And I don't think there's going to be too many actually security updates as much as there could be updates for these things. And um, as well as that, I'd also be pretty worried about um, uh, a lot of those TVs have started to, and like smart devices have started to adapt a lot of the things that regular internet sites have done when it comes to advertising so you'll it'll generate a advertiser id for you and it'll start to collect various different data of your watching habits and there are tvs that have been found with cameras in it that do actually monitor what people are doing when they're in front of the tv so you know um when they're kind of doing those kind of things um they're not they're making them at the lowest price possible and trying to figure out every way that they can generate cost or generate profit for them from the TV being sold. So you kind of end up in a situation where they're really not prioritizing profit and the goal of these is to make them for the lowest price possible. And if you did want to integrate security into it, well, you need software engineers who can do it. They're expensive. You need the facilities for them. Offices are expensive. Um, you need to then pay licensing for all the different products you need to buy to be able to secure these things. So you add cost on that way. And all of a sudden you've added like a hundred thousand dollars to the cost of the R and D of the product. Um, the original budget for that was say a million quid. So your million quid R and D budget is now 1.1 million. It's increased by 10%. Are you going to increase the product by 10% in its retail cost? Um, when everyone else is making it for 10% less, the exact same TV? No, no one's going to do that. So that's kind of where we boil down with those things. And it would be really nice to be able to get security updates, but I don't think it's realistic in how it's kind of uh, discussed. Or how, like if in an ideal way, we would have these things, but no one wants to pay for it, essentially. Um, and Ross Anderson's book, um, the second edition actually has a chapter on security economics. And the third uh, edition coming out soon is going to have an expanded chapter on it. So um, I that will probably do a much better job of explaining these things that I've been talking about much better. Uh, okay. The next up and coming area of security other than 5G worth investigating. Um, that's a really good question. 6G. <laughs> yes, 6G. Um, I have an inkling that it might be um, adversarial neural networks. Um, if you play around with neural networks and you want to get the information you want out of it, you can generally figure out various different aspects of, like you can infer how the black box works. So if you can, if you're smart enough and you know enough about how these systems work, you could probably start to generate adversarial neural networks that will generate pictures that make you look like someone else or make a, a stop sign look like a uh, I don't know a not stop sign or a speed sign or something else um, and I think the if it isn't that area it's going to be how those adversarial neural networks neural networks and embedded systems uh, interact in the real world with different things so if we move to a future where we have all self-driving cars, because insurance companies, whenever they work at an acceptable level, are they're going to be it's going to get really expensive to insure a regular car because they're so unsafe by comparison to self-driving cars. But 
can you make accidents happen in the real world with adversarial neural networks by having those cars do things they weren't supposed to do? Um, and how robust is the testing of these different things? Um, that's kind of where I would see it going. Um, the, the only other thing I could see is like, I don't think we're in the kind of big data era that people kind of hoped for. I think there's another kind of another round of big data to come. And I think you could probably start to do some really interesting things when you have even bigger scale uh, big data products uh, or big data projects. Um, so if you can start to infer mass behavior because humans display a lot of emergent behavior, if you can break down those human behaviors into a series of rules, can you then begin to predict at some kind of scale without violating PNP where we're kind of going with those things. So they'd kind of be the big ones for me. Um, but they're also kind of two away with the fairies type ones as well. That last one definitely sounds like human hacking, if anything. Oh, what about AI? Hello? Is it silence for anyone else? Yeah, it's silent for me. What the hell? Fuck. Oh no, legendary Patman has died. <laughs> Rip. Patty's Rip. dead. <laughs> Patty's dead. Press F in chat, boys. Ah. Uh, hello. Oh. No? Patty. Hello, you there you are. Yeah. Okay, we there we go. Right, right, right. <laughs> um Press weird, F in chat, weird. boys. <laughs> yeah. Um so um uh oh yeah so with ai um neural net like okay it's a bit of a generalization to say that um all neural networks are all of ai because they're not but um the way i'm kind of thinking about it is basically that um if you have some kind of an ai system in a car and that the that uh AI system has been learned in some way, shape, or form that, or taught, or whatever the word you want to use for it is, that um, whenever, uh, when it sees a, a stop sign, that that stop sign means, oh yeah, you need to stop at this point, and you know, the LIDAR says it's this many meters away, and you're moving at this speed, so you need to be braking about here, so there's a comfortable pattern of braking, blah, 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 blah. But what if you can then, um, figure out the algorithm that they used or if you can figure out the set of uh, uh, convolutions or something they had in the neural network that then you can figure out how that system works and then you can f start to find blind spots in that system where it doesn't see the stop sign or what if you can put um manipulate the stop sign in a certain way that uh uh as if if you create like change a series of what are essentially pixels on the stop sign that all of a sudden uh that stop sign means something else like all of a sudden it means oh the the screen the speed limit here increases by x y and z um so i think the kind of area where people start to instead of attacking systems start to attack um something like a, a neural network and figure out what they can get out at the other end of that neural network and what they can do about it and what bad can you do with that neural network see what the thing about that as well though is kind of just dawned on me like you would have to if you were to have it like it was different actual signs if they would actually read the signs you would have to go with like localizations and stuff for like signs being different across the board when it comes to country by country by country but if you they were would, to do like and, and and here's the thing um if you look at um if you look at AI research in America, it is very biased to white men and to a lesser degree, Asian men who curiously just so happen to be doing all of the research on this. Um, and there's been interesting research done that shows that um, when some of this AI powered stuff was put into figuring out who should get parole and who shouldn't get parole, it started to really discriminate against black people because the, the way the system was trained, it's all black people equal criminal, no parole. You know, so if you're doing that from a, yeah, essentially yes, but it, it's called racial bias in AI systems. But the 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 idea behind it is it basically boils down to, um, you know, is that a blind spot that you can do? And that's a massive blind spot in it. And yeah, fair enough, that's one from 
uh, racism and I've been trying not to go in that direction. But there's loads of these different blind spots that exist and there's no kind of any solid research on any of it or there's no one really playing around with it. It's just like you occasionally get like, and I, like I've looked into this because I want to do my thesis on it and you end up with like three papers one paper says by wearing a pair of glasses with a funny color pattern on them you can pretend to be someone who you're not in to uh, official recognition system um and the other two were related to how you could um play with the way that a uh, cars are uh, like self-driving cars react to signs that they see and what they see in the environment you know so i think when people when that goes from kind of like me and my world of tinfoil hats and weird security <laughs> ideas to um to kind of a more mainstream more understood more done thing i think it'll become a much bigger uh thing that people talk about then and becomes a much bigger part of research but for the moment i think that's a, a, a bit off in the future much like the big data thing is <laughs> I was going to make actually fuck. Um, but no, what I was actually, actually what I was going to say is like with the whole localization thing. Actually, it would uh, the only way I could think around to getting around that would be to add like code or stuff, which would obviously make it vulnerable to someone manipulating that. Or not like code, like sort of like you know, like what they have a like on the money that stops it from scanning. I think we mentioned this before, something like that onto the actual sign. If that makes sense. Wait, so you have a thing on the sign on the sign? No, I'm, it's just no, it's just I'm probably just theorizing a thing. But you know how it would cause with differentiation with signs, but it could be to actually going down the road. Kind of like have like a QR code. I'm not saying a QR code, but an actual kind of code thing on the actual sign. Yeah, uh, putting in the actual code. But if you could manipulate that, I'm honestly just. Oh, you, right so you want some kind of like um i i think i know what you mean which is that on the passports they have a, a series of garbled information at yeah. the bottom of them on all passports and that you put that into a scanner and it immediately comes out with all of your information written in that in a in a, in a computer readable format that's always understood yeah. yeah and you could have all of that but my point is but what if I can change that because yeah. you taught a computer to see and computers that see generally turn out to be terrible. Yeah. That's that's how I'm looking at this because um, the way that I'm kind of thinking about it is you can come up with attacks that like, or you can come up with defenses that prevent like me from doing X, Y, and Z to change this, but you're not actually protecting uh how the system learns and i'm thinking about attacking the learning aspect rather than the learned aspect once it already knows yeah true i i want to i want to attack the way the ai figures out what's right and what's wrong because if i can start to use that to reverse what an ai sees when it sees these things then i can sit there and i can start pokey pokey stabby stabby and do bad things even just thinking that there, like I was even thinking of like an alternative way of doing it where it doesn't even see what if, well, obviously it would have to see because it would have to see people on the middle of a second road. But like, um, what do you call them? Sort of like a GPS kind of a situation where it would know where it is and it would know the traffic speed of that particular place. Yeah, but like, okay, fine. So you have like one defense and that's against speed. But like, what if the way that the system is set, like you, every program has control flow. So what mm -hmm. if you take the control flow and you set the control flow up that it doesn't go GPS first, it goes what it sees first. Mm -hmm. Well, if it sees a thing and it perfectly reads it to that and doesn't read any kind of an error about it, the control flow is just going to sit there and go, okay, next part of the program, we're in a 30 mile an hour zone, you know? True, true. Uh, like, actually, like you, you can go and attack all the, I, I know I've seen that, I'll um, come to that in a second, but like the way that I'm thinking about it is I don't want to uh, attack what the car sees, I want to attack how the car learns. Yeah, that that's the difference in how I'm kind of approaching these things, because you could do all of these different things. And sometimes it might involve like putting a pic because like the research that I've seen has there is a pixel that you pop onto a um, a stop sign and it makes the stop sign essentially invisible to the car. Jesus, you know? I think I've actually seen a video about that. Uh, you might have. We might have talked about it earlier in the year, but it's the kind of thing where that's the kind of thing that you can do. You know, so and and that's by attacking not uh, what the computer sees, but how the car, uh, how the computer learned what it sees. 
That actually reminds me of, didn't they do kind of like the same thing kind of Hong Kong? With, uh, not with cars, obviously, but with people with facial recognition. They paint their faces or something to hide, uh, hide them from the facial recognition software. Yeah, th- there's um, there's a bunch of different, uh, like, like there's countermeasures against certain bits of facial recognition. Um, so the one that I looked into was um, where you could print a pattern from a regular in- inkjet printer onto glasses and you could put them on and become, uh, depending on what you did and how you did it, you could impersonate someone else or if you didn't impersonate someone else, you could, um, uh, what was the other one? Uh, you could uh, become uh, like transparent essentially to the camera. The camera sees that there is a person there and like on video, there is a person clearly there, but the computer system that sees the whole thing doesn't see the person because they're not programmed to notice that there is a, a, a person there or anything else. Yeah. And, th- and that's that's gotten as well through attacking how the how the system learns. Good point, actually, yeah. Sorry, I'm just like Charlie trying to like turn on my head and then my head realizes, oh, you're still tired. <laughs> yeah. Um, government testing AI to control their nukes or something, something about when attacking the training data. That I sounds like probably, a bad idea in general. I probably should have heard about that. Um, do you know, I, I'm, I know a load of nuclear people on Slack. I'm going to ask the, um, do a quick search on Slack and see what pops out. It just sounds like a really bad idea, though. Uh... There was a tweet ages ago, can't remember. Hmm. Okay, so there's a tweet about something. Uh... Why are we giving robots all this power? Has nobody so... ever seen uh, Terminator? Yes, but Terminator is what's called fiction, and especially it's science fiction. And come on, politicians aren't going to read science fiction. Yeah, that's a good um, point. Like, when has this ever happened before? There's never been anything like this. Wait a fuck. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I have from my friends who are, I, I have some friends who are um, experts in nuclear weapons, and they have one whole thing on all of the slack. Um, and <laughs> it's about a novel. So, um, I, I'm not familiar with any of that. Um, I probably should, but um, if you know more about it, let me know. But um, I would, I would really like to take. Um... Oh, Zephyr, I, 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 you don't know me. I have weird fucking friends, man. It's great. <laughs> um, my hobby on the, I got into uh, monitoring North Korea because I have a lot of friends in the arms control community. So, um, you know. We worry a lot about nuclear weapons and stuff and things. Um, but uh, government testing AI to control. See, I would be worried about the implications of. So, th- like, this basically boils down to the plot of Doctor Strange Love, where the Soviets invent a doomsday weapon that they don't tell anyone about. But. The doomsday weapon essentially means that if you nuke us, we put like, I don't know, it's probably like a Cobalt-60 bomb or something into the ocean and Cobalt-60 basically poisons the ocean for the rest of time. And, you know, with evaporation, all of that will go up into the uh, into clouds and then come down as rain. And then all of a sudden, hey, presto magic, you have destroyed the entire capacity for life on Earth. Um, so, you know, if you, that basically works by if it detects a nuclear attack because of a series of different things that happen in the environment, well, shit, this is bad. We better fucking nuke everyone. Um, But um, that basically, the outcome of that is that how do you know when the system thinks that there is actually enough whatever product in the environment that it's smelling through sensors or something else that it can figure out that this is bad and you need to do something about it um, like a big cobalt 60 bomb um, if you put that in the control of AI oh, oh man I wouldn't like to think about what an AI would think about like like if like it's a, a sufficiently capable AI system I wouldn't like to think about what it would do when it got access to nuclear weapons because if it's because nuclear weapons are like a 
they're a humanitarian problem, but they're also a geopolitical problem. So yes, humans are the problem. So if it's if it sees the the problem being very simply that um, if it sees the problems are the people, yeah, basically it's the plot to board games. It's a zero sum game. That's that's kind of where I'm going with it. But like the difference is like instead of that being a program, this is um, an AI that in theory can think for itself and. What the fuck is it going to do when it can think for itself? Jesus fucking Christ. Well, we see it mixed between Terminator and War Games. <laughs> yeah. So, um, like, I, I'm not a big fan of auto autonomous weapon systems to begin with. Um, I like it, it's. It, I don't think we should be implementing. Like, there's a big difference between like inventing a new version of like Super Facebook. Um, where uh yeah basically it could be matrix repeated who knows but i i've i've like if, if we implement super facebook super facebook is facebook on steroids and everything is so much worse but we understand how that technology works and we understand what it does the problem with doing this with ai systems is if you read the actual literature that the ai researchers are working on some of it's terrifying because it's essentially they're having discussions of philosophy because they don't understand why their systems come out with this like why does this system know that that's a cat and that's a dog you know so if we're sitting there and we're making the leap of it knows what cats and dogs are and no one knows why how do you then make the jump to well, we're given nuclear weapons. You know, like, that's just... Like, th that's incredible human stupidity and negligence in my book, but, you know. I've actually uh, just got a question there, actually. So, um, you know how you were saying with a... Sorry to derail this whole conversation, uh, derail the no, whole thing. it's fine, it's fine. But, uh... I, I, I got nothing better to do, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm in <laughs> lockdown. <laughs> yeah, no, same. Uh, well, obviously, I mean, I've... Yeah, oh, I'm it's from the bulletin. Awesome. I love the bulletin. Um, is that good or bad? Oh, wait, the bulletin. Yeah, yeah. See, I was yeah, gonna the ask bulletin of the Atomic that. Scientists. I, I have a yeah. subscription to these guys. I love these guys. Um, is it? Give me your subscription. Oh, my God. Give yes. it now. Those, who the Join fuck me. are those? <laughs> An article What's of War on the Rocks. Oh, goody, War on the Rocks. I don't know who any of those two people are. Um, nuclear Command and Control, Hypersonic Weapons. I think I should just give you a second. Well, I'm going to need to quickly, like, there's a lot in these, so I'm probably going to have to come back to it. I probably won't have enough time to sure look enough. at it. But it seems to, like, on a quick skim of it, it comes down to um, a lot of the gist of what I see. And actually, it brings up a very valid point in that um, there is uh, Stanislav Petrov, who uh, figured out that uh, the early warning system that thought it detected attacks actually detected uh, the sun bouncing off clouds so um yeah if you put that in the hands of an ai an ai is going to look at that and go well i've been trying to detect this and that's it and then it's going to launch the weapons and everybody dies the end um whereas because there's a human in the loop there and the human knows how the system works and built the, the system say what you like about humans being terrible but like I will take random dude called Stanislav Petrov versus AI system called whatever the fuck. So, um, like in that kind of instance, like hundred percent, I'm on board with the the human control of them. You know, um, yeah, yeah. I will have a read of that later, and I'll, I'll pop a um, and the War on the Rocks article, and I'll pop a um comment in discord because that'll just uh subject for another talk probably not because i don't think anyone wants to hear me talk about nuclear weapons for an hour um did we do that or, last time? well not even nuclear what <laughs> did we do that last time <laughs> <laughs> um, come to the last thing just go back in time go to the old talk and then watch that and then come back here do you have a time machine yeah. to do it <laughs> I, look the problem with doing um it's not that I doubt the members of it. Like everybody, there's this weird overlap between people in cybersecurity and people being interested in gigantic things that go boom. So I completely understand. And like, I think they're fascinating, but like, 
it, it's like the cyber warfare talk where before I can talk about Stuxnet, I need to explain why Stuxnet works, which requires me to explain nuclear physics. So it, the, if you want to actually talk about nuclear weapons, I, like I can have a slideshow that's essentially a series of huge explosions, which yes. you can do yourself with Google, or oh. you can have me explain why they work and do that. And that turns into an extremely boring thing that I don't fully understand. Um, you'll completely listen to anything that I have to say. Yeah. Um, if you do want to <laughs> listen a bit more about like that kind of thing, well, read a bit more about it. I have a couple of things in my blog where I've tried to estimate how many nuclear weapons North Korea is capable of making. So if you want to read that with that kind of depth, you can or figure it out and learn. You can. I would go and read that, that blog post, the two blog posts instead and wait for me to publish round two of those because i've drop, had um, what, talking. what yeah okay um they're somewhere down on the main page um but like i would go into them rather than actually doing a talk on them um just because of how kind of uh, complicated they are because there's a lot of background and understanding and stuff and i don't know where people's kind of um like i don't know the audience when it comes to uh people's understanding of these things you know, um, yeah. It's like doing the uh, like Sean wants me to do an open source talk on um, how I figured. Well, not just me, like how and my, uh, my group of friends in my uh, open source intelligence group figured out that Iran shot down uh, the airliner earlier this year before they admitted to it. Yeah, I and, heard about that. We were talking about that in the cafeteria, weren't we? Yeah, and yeah. It's the outside exists. <laughs> Go on. Yeah. When I discuss that with people that I know, and I know what their education base is on the, these kind of things, it's very easy for me to take a half an hour and explain the whole thing start to finish. But I don't know what people's kind of knowledge base on these kind of things is. I don't know where people stand on geolocating things. Um, like um, I was recently interviewed elsewhere for that same thing and it basically boiled down to um 99 of the audience have no idea what you're talking about so you need to simplify all of this um so when you don't know what it is it's very hard for me to make a talk especially on extremely complex well not like open source intelligence isn't, and like ground truth imagery analysis and um photogrammetry isn't extremely knowledge intense um i can teach anyone to do it over the course of a couple of hours but uh, why is there Google on stream? Um, but um, Ooh, let's see what he's googling. <laughs> not anymore. Oh. Not. Um, so you know, they're kind of things I could teach you over a period of time, but to actually like reverse back through the steps without having that knowledge is much more difficult. Um, so I'd kind of be wary about doing either of those two talks just because I don't know where people stand on their understanding of nuclear physics and stuff. And even at that, like, I know the only reason that I know the stuff that I know is because I know people who are experts on this stuff. Um, and without them, I kind of wouldn't know as much as I do about them. So to reverse all of that kind of stuff backwards um, and make it useful for you guys, I think it'd be really difficult to do. And I, I, I'm also not a fan of, like, stepping outside of where my knowledge does lie. If I did, I'd probably have a bajillion talks that I, and I could give one a week for the rest of the year. But um, I don't like doing it. And I like to put the research in and do them right. So I just be, I'd be a bit wary about doing those kind of things, like, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah no, I get you. You kind of, you want to have kind of like a solid basis. And at the same time, I mean, in fairness, like you could have, honestly, I'm open for you to do as many talks as you want because we have a lot of time during quarantine, and both of us probably have a lot of work to do. Yeah, over but, the, but, over this. yeah but my, but do you have any idea how long my talks take to write? <laughs> yeah, good point. I mean, yeah. I kind of do. I mean, fuck, I, I haven't written a, a talk since, well, I haven't properly written a talk for the Hacker Talk since November, maybe December. Yeah. So I already know how long it takes talks. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm just going to give it back. And what's this writing talking business about? I just talk. Seth, you've set me how many pages you've written. You're on 130 pages. You can fuck off. <laughs> so you can you can just talk about things, which is what I'm doing now, and I'm perfectly capable of just talking. But like when it comes to actually doing a, a lecture, and I want to have, um, uh, if I want to have 
the actual information factually backed up and I want to have sources for everything and stuff like that. That takes time. And like, if you look at the cyber weapons talk that I did the last time, that talk took, um, I've given versions of it for the past couple of years, but it took two years in total to write start to finish. And the reason it took so long is just simply because I want to make sure that I have the factual information and I have the sources and I have read all of the different things that I would like to talk about for it. So that kind of thing just ends up throwing in a pile of extra time into it, which is a pain. But if I wanted to be fun and talk about my research or something like that, that's a much easier, quicker thing to do. I do that. Except I don't have anything on the go at the moment, but North Korea, but that's not relevant. What's your primary research focus on right now? Um, the impact of the coronavirus on threat modeling or how implicit biases and... Um, What's the other one? Implicit biases and unaccounted for assumptions have impacted people's business continuity management during the pandemic. So like when I've talked to a few people, they're pretty adamant that um, their threat models always assume that, okay, look, something could happen to a site. We have hot site, we have cold site, we have like warm site, we have like work from home things in place for a certain capacity of our staff. But what if no one can go to the office or um like the fact that pandemics weren't planned for even though um like if you read uh, the foundations of information security in the physical security threat section and this is a book from 2019 it actually talks about how this is the kind of thing you should be worried about on like page 109 or 119 or something like that so yeah i'm sure you will i could check now it'll only take two seconds um but it's the kind of thing where um, these things should have been accounted for, but aren't accounted for. And we need to be able to, um, like there's a lot of things that we can learn from our threat models to kind of uh, learn from these. It's actually on page uh, 122. Um, so he talks, he talks about the different threats there. So yeah. Oh, Mark Lane is here. Hello, Mark. How are you, Paddy? Not too bad yourself. Not too bad. Just talking about your you favorite subject. Um, politics. Business continuity management. Um, oh, did I catch his uh, cheating on, on business not, not at all. assignment or something? Not at all. No. <laughs> so yeah, is there any more? Oh, uh, I answered the research thing. So yeah, any other questions then? I just have a question considering the talk that uh, you were saying about, this is one of my, the questions we want to say for a while. So you were saying about, um, what do you call them? Uh, basically anything. So basically, what is a computer? Oh. <laughs> it's called a computer. <laughs> computer. Computer. Yeah. It, it is a series of circuits that through emergent properties is able to compute things. All right, I'm off. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, that's what's something I've had like in probably three times in my message box from Zebrafish being like, ask what a computer is. Um, yeah. In fact, actually... If, if, you have a look, if you go to YouTube and you look for Ben Eater, Ben Eater has a series of tutorials on how you can build your own 8-bit computer from literally just circuits and uh, are from like a few integrated circuits, but mostly wires, resistors, and LEDs. So um, yeah, Tiernan was just about to send it. So basically, Ben breaks down how the computer acts functions and what makes a computer a computer and like the impact of um bo uh, boyd's algorithm for kind of like uh boyd's algor algorithm basically lays out that you can have a series of um a series how a series of simple rules like three or four simple rules can bring emergent behavior out of it that then allows you to do other things with it so if you want to learn how birds fly in massive formations without crashing into each other and falling out of the sky and how like two different flocks of birds can come together and fly along a lot of that comes down to Boyd's algorithm and how a few simple rules for like not crashing into each other keeping a certain level of distance between them and moving within a certain predefined like box that's imaginary and then following 
like whoever the leader of this flock is along it allows you to then follow along for the whole thing. I'm not gonna lie, that's probably the first time somebody's actually given a proper answer to what a computer is. <laughs> I do my best. Yeah, like we've been we've been memeing this for about what like two, three months. <laughs> Someone's actually given yeah. an answer to the meme. You've killed the meme, Pat. <laughs> Tiernan, uh, look, you, you should know this. I'm a total buzzkill. Um, yeah. <laughs> Tiernan, just share a playlist because a playlist is going to be so much better than a single oh, video. Because he, I like, gotta say it. you really need him in a uh, playlist like that. I find it so funny that the one time I'm about to ask the trolliest question, <laughs> Mark fucking had to come in. Yeah, oh. Happens, happens, happens. And already left. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I fucking love Mark so much. He's such great crack. Yeah. I'm only saying that so he doesn't fail me. Um, no, I'm kidding. I actually fucking love him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, where is it? I'd uh, actually back to go on to the week to the AS ACLs. Sorry, my questions are all over the place, but I kind of just went on a notepad. It's all just there's no order to my to my notes. They are just randomness. But yeah, on the on the ACL things, is there any particular weaknesses to ACLs that you can kind of find? Because I read it somewhere in the book, but I didn't look through it thoroughly. Um, their complexity can fuck you over because you can look at a company like Capital One who um, had all the correct permissions in all the correct places, doing all the right things, done the way Amazon will tell you you should do them in AWS to get these levels of protections. And um, I think they missed like one thing or they don't give access to everything generally considered to be a good idea. That would be least privilege, yes. Um, but it's the kind of thing where um, because of the complexity of them, they missed like one tiny thing. And then when a disgruntled employee left, the disgruntled employee knew that that one gap was there and nothing was done about it. And they were able to use that to have a breach of Capital One. So you know, if, if you don't continually keep it, a lot of these things that I'm talking about are continuous processes that you will do like once a month or once every six months or once a year or once every two years or something like that to maintain um, the level of proficiency within the organization and train people into the positions of people leaving all sorts. So because they're continuous processes, um, one thing and security is fluid one of the things that is good now may not be good in the future so you it's basically the goal of keeping on top of these things and making sure you're in a position where these aren't issues anymore you'll just be able to straight go and uh, be able to change things reasonably on the fly you'll always have some kind of a gap between the world changing and you catching up to the change so if you look in patching there's a thing called patch gaps where you know you can't just update a system because there's an update you need to test it and make sure the whole thing will run and that's why like patch tuesday comes on a tuesday because you can come in refreshed at the start of the week on monday do whatever needs to be done for the week on tuesday you can begin the testing procedure and you can test through to thursday where on friday or over the weekend you then patch everything and when everyone comes in the next week everything is up and running and functioning and um, that's in an ideal world but um you know, you might also end up in a scenario where that's not going to work because uh, a new version, like this happens on Linux occasionally. Um, yeah, I think that's the one there from Tiernan as well. So that video is fantastic. Um, but um, what basically ends up happening is you might, uh, a new update might require a different compiler version and the compiler version hasn't been updated on your system yet. So you need to wait on the compiler version to update or any number of these different variables that come down. Maybe there's a system where you can't risk um, patching it right now because it's mission critical and the application is unstable for whatever different reason. So these, because this is the concept, uh, these concepts are fluid and they change. You need to be able to account for them in your risk management and keep them going in a continuous fashion. If that answers your question. It does answer my question for the most part. Actually, it allowed me to another question I've written down. Is there any particular like when it comes to updating kind of with a computer or kind of a thing, especially when it comes to systems? It's like especially when like uh, is there any particular tips so, you'd give when it's like for an actual company on updating? Because so, you know, like we get zero days that come out and all that stuff and fuck you over and stuff. So. It comes down, so there's an idea in risk management called risk tolerance. 
And uh, like one of the things that like I like the more I read and understand about information security, the more I kind of think that like I like banks need to start finding their risk professionals and shifting them into cybersecurity as well as like financial risk and using them to then figure out how best to calculate risk and then write books on how ca on, on this risk calculation because it basically boils down to our everyone has a certain appetite for risk or tolerance for risk that they are willing to accept so where you set that bar versus how big um how big of an impact a vulnerability you could have in your company kind of is where the balance lies for um where you stand with everything so you might decide that okay that zero day is a cvss score of 10 we have to patch that really quickly and hope nothing breaks whereas you know uh, another zero day might come out and the zero day might only work when it's at the end of a chain of exploits and without the chain of exploits you kind of sit there and go okay it's a bad exploit but like eh so you might decide to put that one onto the back burner until the exploits it needs come along or until um because your risk will shift so um uh, whatever the zero day is, it might be the top exploit that you want to deal with at this moment. Um, but then once that goes, the next one in your queue of uh, risky uh, exploits to deal with comes up. So then you look for patching that one and you kind of you form a queue of the ones that you need to deal with now versus the ones that you don't. Or you put them into batches where you're going to deal with them in batches. So when you look at Microsoft ones, they talk about them in terms of them. Um, uh critical um advisable or something like that and then there's another one for not that important but you know good um so you would you might look at them that like when a critical update comes out we update them within a certain period of time and you put that into the batch of ones that need to be done in the next week or two weeks or something like that and that like it basically comes down to the risk that you're looking to take on because that this exploit exists and how far you're looking to go with that exploit and i guess i'm saying so now in a similar way, say if you see a hand for comedy. And, I, uh, I the, can't hear you. Go back there. Uh, well, I'm sort of getting the idea where, like, say if you're an IT admin for a company and uh, what, Patch Tuesday comes around and you find, uh, you know, would you suggest, like, automatically updating with the Patch Tuesday or would you say, like, leave it a week, sort of let? No, see you, ha thing you, have to, you have to test your si the systems. Like, yeah. if, like, if there is an update for Windows and it changes how your payroll software works and it is a day in a couple of days. Do you want to risk taking down the payment infrastructure of the company so no one gets paid because that update didn't work? That's the kind of thing that that's the risk calculation that you're making. You know, you, there could be this update, but maybe you can't update for something for some reason. Maybe there's a mission critical thing. Maybe you like some companies only release patches once every three months rather than once a month. Uh, Oracle and Adobe do that. They do quarterly patching. You know, some people think that's better. Some people think it's worse. But you need to then sit, sit down and figure out in your patching schedule, what, how bad is this vulnerability? And what can you afford in a patching gap? And can you afford to keep on top of that level of risk for that period of time? If you can't, you need to patch that sooner. And if you can, you might just patch everything once every three months when you do like quarterly maintenance or something like that. It, it comes down to you need to figure out when these things work for you. I can't tell you a defined time. You need to come up with a risk management strategy that works for you, or you need to adopt someone else's risk management, risk management strategy that works for you. And then you need to go through the process of managing that risk. And then at that point, you can then start to consider, okay, now we need to update everything. And then how do we go about, what's the procedure for updating everything? Do we have like a defined process of how we do X, Y, and Z and how we go about the whole thing? So it's kind of like a, Obviously, the scenario though, you'd like if you get big attacks, you'd have to update those sort of things. So yeah. The what? If you get a big what? If you got like obviously something mission critical, like with the idea. Remember when uh, wanna keep or wanna cry? Jesus, wanna keep? Uh, yeah. Wanna cry came around. That was kind of like an instance sort of like that. But if you get like some small, you could sort of if it screws everything up, then you sort of have to weigh your pros and cons, kind of a thing. Yeah. But that's that. That's the way all of these things are. That's the thing. You you might decide that. We like okay with WannaCry. We use SMB for 
all of our file shares and we let our employees get in remotely and we don't have a VPN. So we have an SMB file share, uh, like SMB one exposed to the internet at all times. We cannot afford to lose all of the company data because that is the end of the company. Like if you go through a process of total information loss, that is nearly irrecoverable. There have been three companies that have recovered from that, as far as I know, ever. There's the NHS, there's Saudi Aramco, and there is a Mayart line. Oh, and four, Merck Pharmaceuticals. They are the four companies that I know of that have had total information losses and recovered, ever. You know? So if you're going to look at that, like WannaCry is essentially an existential threat to your business if that's how your business is structured. But if your business uses a VPN to access SMB, which is only inside the network at all times, well, how does WannaCry get in? It doesn't. You know, it, no, it doesn't get in. So WannaCry is like catastrophically bad, but not for you because that's how your risk management strategy is built up. You've designed, your, like you've gone through all the different processes that I mentioned in like network design and all that kind of stuff and laid things out in such a specific way that you don't have to worry about that because you've done the correct things along the way and you've kept everything like towards like, what, we don't really have best practices in cybersecurity as much as people talk about them, but you have done to your best of your knowledge what best practices are. You know, and with those best practices being implemented and implemented correctly with your risk management and all that done, you can look at WannaCry and go, Jesus Christ, that's bad. But like, whew, we're lucky. We're not affected. You know, it, it like that's the thing about this. It comes there. There are a lot of variables and you need to be able to balance the variables and work with the variables. And mo like if you read the NIST cybersecurity document where it breaks down the four different types of companies, it becomes very quickly apparent that like, like most companies like the top three or the first three of the four categories basically say you're incapable of correctly doing any of this but you're incapable of doing it at different levels of terribleness and then finally you have one which is like you're pretty good at this but you can still fuck up you know so and, and that's basically how this boils down to okay i got half of that by the way it kind of cut out a little bit <laughs> did it cut but, out uh... Yeah, no, no, like I, my fucking internet's decided that it hates life. It's Virgin Media me. Um, hate that, hate that. It? Okay. I was actually, actually on that. Sorry, I'm pulling a blank. Actually, does anybody else have any other questions? Because I'm sort of pulling a blank right now. I'm having a bit of a stroke mentally. No, I, I'm assuming that. Oh. Deb's writing something. Yeah, actually, that uh, is a good question. How bad was the... Um, the NHS was only part... Well, yeah, they were fucked, but only certain trusts. Uh, the NHS, if I, like, I'm, I'm not a don't know much about the NHS. I think Zephyr can do this, but um, it's broken into multiple different trusts for different areas of the UK, if I remember rightly. And some of the trusts were hit and some of them weren't, depending on how they, yeah. So um, some of the trusts were hit and some of them weren't. And the ones that were hit were really badly fucked. Like, like loss of, <laughs> like basically everything you know, and they have to try and recover from uh, basically a total loss of everything. Um, so, yeah, um, Zephyr's typing there, so he might have some more clarification on that. I, I um, often feel, actually, wouldn't the NHS be something that shouldn't be allowed to fail, sort of like, if it were to fail, the government would sort of, like, stop it? Yeah, but by law in Ireland, electricity isn't supposed to fail, and electricity fails. True, true. You know, like, device. yeah, medical devices were taken online, um, it's a bit like COVID, but uh, it isn't a human denial of service. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it and and like that's what it would do. It would deny uh, their ability to serve customers, essentially, or people, or whatever you want to call them. So you know, you end up in a situation where you can't do cat scans or pet scans, or you can't run an operating theater. Those kind of different things. You can't. So you can't do a lot of stuff, and it basically denies the ability of the company to provide services, or NHS to provide services. Um, yeah. Is there anything else you then? Feel that. You, you feel that though, like, 
or I'd assume I wouldn't, uh, I'm not a doctor, first off. You think, like, what obviously with, like, medical practices being old enough anyway, they'd be able to, in the idea of WannaCry being sort of, you know, destroying, like, the NHS, they'd be able to sort of go, like, okay, we've had some, like, non-technical sort of stuff that so, we can use so here. So, you would think that's the case, mm. but you know how your toaster isn't a toaster? It's actually a computer that heats bread. And your car isn't a car, it's a computer with wheels. Um, you joke, but I'm serious. The x-ray machine isn't an x-ray machine. It's a computer that can shoot x-rays and then images. Oh, yeah, no, I don't mean um, like x-ray machines. No, I know, but, but this is the case in generally everything. Like, your patient record system isn't a series of pieces of paper on a clipboard like we see in lots of American dram pieces of shit and stuff like that. The uh, For a lot of the stuff... Um, like last time I was in hospital, which is like a few years ago now at this stage, but like they weren't a whole pile of clipboards hanging around ever. Like um, the uh, heart rate monitor was um, uh, a computer. The pulse oximeter was a computer. The oxygen system, well, actually the oxygen system was uh, controlled by the thing, um, by just a knob, which is great, and a little valve to measure it. So that like you'd be able to supply oxygen, but you know, so many of your other systems wouldn't work. But yeah, no, I wasn't thinking sort of stuff like that. I mean, obviously they're critical sort of stuff. I'll be, you how, get how, do you know, how, how do you know what patient is in and what their issues mm -hmm. are um, if they don't have... Uh, like, how do you treat a patient when you don't know which patient is who? You know, yeah. like what? Like what if you like what if someone comes in and has um, some kind of an issue and you give them the wrong medication? Like you can kill them doing that. Like so, you you need the patient records, and because it's not on paper anymore, if the computer system turns off, you can't do anything with it. And if you can't do anything with it, you can't treat your patient. You well, know, I and, and especially if, if you. I yeah. couldn't imagine how much paper you would need to be able to treat a country, like yeah. it's. Like the size of warehouses that you would require. Um, the NSA Greece thing from 2005 that I mentioned. Um, hang on, a Zephyr Fish is typing there. He might have a clarification. <laughs> um, so I'll wait and see that, and then I'll do the Greece one. Oh, you, ah. you're right. Okay, cool. Well, look, thanks for coming along, and hopefully I'll be able to make your talk on Friday. Yeah. I'll see you, Zeph. I remember, what is a computer? And ultimate, uh, oh, what's it? Hacks confirmed. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> I keep sending him hacks confirms every every now and again. He sends it back. It's a great meme. They have wrong yeah. memes. <laughs> I'm going to wait for, the, if you want to talk about the NSA thing, or will we wait for intern? And yeah. Talk? So the gist of it is that, um, man, it's been a while since I've read about this, but I always think about it when it comes to 5G. Um, the gist of it is that, um, <laughs> yes. Uh, that's the wrong one. You need laser eyed Kim Jong Un. Um, that's himself, actually. Would you believe? Oh, <laughs> he, sent well, himself, he, he sent a picture, and I, I might have went a little bit laser eyed back. it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the thing with the NSA in Greece in 2005, um, I don't remember. I don't know if we know why or if it was published, and I don't remember why the uh, NSA was. Um, monitoring people in Greece who if I remember rightly were like the government and um the gist of it is um every these phone systems have what are called lawful intercept uh capabilities and uh the idea behind lawful intercept is if you get a legal warrant you can uh you become legally allowed to then wiretap someone's device and be able to listen to it um and record text messages phone calls all those different bits of it the problem with this is you're then putting a thing into a computer system that allows uh the computer to authorize this lawful intercept capability for anyone and the nsa figured out through whatever means that the way it was set up in greece is the lawful intercept system was set up on two systems. There was one to check that everything was lawful and then one to actually do it. And the only one that was installed in Greece at the time was the one that allowed you to do the, um, 
to do the lawful intercept. So what the NSA did was they went in, they figured out how to use an exploit in some weird arcane programming language to turn off logging for only their lawful intercepts. So no one knew they were making the lawful intercepts for the longest time. And they used it to listen to uh, and record the calls and text messages of the prime minister and some high ranking ministers and advisors and that kind of thing. Um, which is pretty standard espionage stuff. If you're not spying on your enemies and your friends, you're not doing espionage right. So um, that that's the gist of what they did. I know there's more detail to it out there, but it's been years since I've read up on it. I just think it's a really fascinating um, look into how 5G, when done wrong, could go badly. Because if you put that uh, lawful intercept thing on every device rather than in a centralized place because you have to put them on every in on every device because there is no centralized infrastructure for 5g that's kind of where the problem really comes out with it uh does that answer your question or do you do you want anything more on that Anything else then, or are we all good? Because I'm running out of uh, water. Uh, well, actually, it was being suggested. You want to just sort of uh, leave it there, if that's all right? 100% with me. Yeah. Uh, so then I'll just say thanks for everybody for coming. Uh, sorry that I sound like I'm dying inside, because I am dying inside because of quarantine. And uh, to come back tomorrow on Friday, we'll be having Zephyrfish talking about Red Team Security. Thank you so much for coming along, Paddy, again, for doing a talk for us. We always love to have you here. Uh, no probably annoy you over the summer break to get you to do it again, if that's alright with yourself. <laughs> yeah. You, you have no choice. We're, we're keeping this going because I have nothing better to do. And if it counts as extra credit, it counts as extra credit. Mark. Also fair. Uh, <laughs> can I do my thesis on this? Can I change my thesis entirely? Screw whatever the hell I was doing originally. Um, but yeah. Anyway, uh, thank you so much. Oh god. Yeah, I was also kind of running out of questions to ask because I was looking at my notes and then asking them and I was kind of like, well, that question was shite. <laughs> but not like shite. You guys, like, you guys know by now. Like a massive noob. I'm going to start calling this noobs ask, ask uh, people who know what they're doing questions. <laughs> oh yeah, because I know what I'm doing. But look, it's, it's one of those things where as long as there's questions, you know me, I'm happy to talk shit for as long as it takes. So yeah. Yeah. So if I do a talk, I'm not a noob. Therefore, you're always a noob. Ultimate hacks confirmed. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna get a wallop next B sides. <laughs> gonna walk into B sides London, just get a whack. <laughs> uh, cool. Something Zeph would need because Zeph doesn't know what a computer is. Oh, Zeph wants you to use Arch, so I'm gonna ban Zeph. Axe <laughs> confirmed. Okay, you can finish it. <laughs>